pleasure to welcome Dan to Oxford. So I'd like to begin by asking you, Dan, at the beginning of Darwin's Dangerous Idea, you said, if I had to give a prize for the best idea anyone ever had, I'd give it to Darwin ahead of Newton, Einstein, and everybody else. Now, I rather agree with that, but I take it you don't mean that Darwin's was the cleverest idea anyone ever had. It was the most, what, revolutionary, the, yes. the one that did the most yeah. heavy lifting in terms of changing people's um, ideas. That's what I meant, and I, I, I still think it's right, and I've been delighted how many times that's been quoted since then, people seeing the point. It's Darwin's idea that unifies everything, from, from physics and quarks all the way to ethics and art and, and, and morality and love through the idea of natural selection, which is responsible for all the living things and all the artifacts that living things make. Not just the beaver's dam and the ant hill and the termite mound, but the cathedrals and the poetry and the music and the systems of, of law and so forth. Now you could mean by that that um, natural selection <coughs> produces <coughs> brains which then make cathedrals yeah. and laws. Or you could mean that, natural, mm. that something a bit like natural selection actually works on uh, human artifacts, which is a bit of a stretch, but, but that is yeah. another way of applying Darwin. Uh, that's another way, and uh, funny you should mention it, Richard, because I cite you as the, as the sort of principal author of that idea, the idea of a meme of cultural evolution, as you know, and have acknowledged there are other people who had similar ideas before you, but you're the one who clarified it and made it made it a really tempting theoretical prospect. And uh, I'm one of those who picked up the meme idea and thought, no, this is, this is not just a metaphor. This is serious, this is a good idea. And actually right now I'm planning, as soon as I finish the book I'm working on, to write a book about mimetics and memes, the bad arguments against them, and what, what it really can do. And I think that it's not just memes. I think that one of the fundamental insights that we can get from a Darwinian perspective is the idea that just as trees, let's say, there's many brilliant details to trees. They're brilliantly designed, but by nobody. There's lots of reasons why trees have the arrangement of parts that they do. And the same is true of many cultural entities they are cunningly organized to perpetuate themselves and to protect themselves. And sometimes, rarely, there's a human being or a group of human beings or a cabal of priests or something like that that have actively designed this thing, but usually not. Usually the design is exactly, has exactly the same provenance as the design of the bird's wing. It came about by differential replication of what are basically unintended, more or less mindless mutations. It's important to understand that in both cases, both for genes and means, natural selection does work at the level of the replicator. It's, it's changing yep. the frequencies with yep. which replicators uh, are found in the replicator pool. And so something like a bird's wing, which you, which you mention, is, is not a replicator. I mean, it's, no. a, it's, it's, it's phenotype which is, which is produced by um, a long uh, succession of cumulative selection mm -hmm. of genes improving birds' wings. I mean, something like a religion um, yes. uh, has not been designed, or maybe, it, maybe some of them have, I mean, Scientology. A good example, yes. There's, there's a intelligent design for you right there. <laughs> so Scientology is intelligent design. Mormonism is possibly intelligently yes, designed. Yes. Um, rather less intelligently. Um, and, yeah. um, but, but the more interesting yeah. idea is that, is that religions and other cultural entities yeah. achieve the structure that they do by a, more than just kind of natural, I mean a real natural a real selection. Natural, natural selection. Of, self-replicating entities, mm. and you, you mentioned just now um, bad objections to the idea. I mean, one, one of those bad objections, it seems to me, is, the, is that unlike genes, which have a very high fidelity replication, DNA has very high fidelity replication, memes are often said to be so inaccurately copied 
that they won't function. And I've got an answer to that. I expect you have as well. Yes, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I certainly do. But first, let me just give you a, a nice example, which I much admire. A French philosopher, I think he was a philosopher, maybe an anthropologist, observing um, canoes made in Polynesia. And he made the I think, lovely point that um, these Polynesians, they, they're just, they're, they're not clever designers. They're just making boats the way my grandfather and his father before him made boats. But the sea is the selector. The boats that come back, they copy. <laughs> the boats that don't come back, they don't copy. It's natural selection right there. A uh, uh, pure example of it. Uh, I think that um, I think that the key for me is that language is the key element in in cultural transmission. I think language, which only one species has, not you know real language, as opposed to a simple communication system. Um, words themselves have replicative norms. They, they're, like, they're like genes in this regard. And it's the fact that we can <laughs> transmit cultural information with language, which secures the level of fidelity which is needed for um, cumulative selection. If you we could imagine doing an experiment, uh, what um, the English call Chinese whispers mm -hmm. and the Americans call telephone, where you have a, a line of, tw of 20 children. Mm -hmm and you whisper something into the ear of the first mm -hmm. child, you whisper it into the ear of the second, and it goes on down the line. And the question is, will it survive 20 generations of transmission? Mm -hmm. And the answer is that it very likely will, if it's short enough, and if it's spoken in the language that the children understand. No. Uh, because no. even no. though one child may say it in a Scottish accent, one in an Irish accent, one in an American accent, no. so that by no means is it is it replicated with the fidelity of DNA? Nevertheless, it's self-normalizing. Yeah, yeah. Um, because all the children in the line have the same lexicon from which yeah. they draw yeah. the words as they yeah. hear them. If, on the other hand, the message is given in Serbo-Croat, assuming that we're not, I mean, assuming that we're in, yeah. in England, then all the children can do is copy phonetically what they hear. And then it really will change extremely rapidly and at the end of the 20th child will be unrecognizable. One of the points about language that I love to stress, everybody is very impressed with the fact that language is a great vehicle of communication and comprehension. They less often notice that language is great even when you don't understand it. That language has the self-normalizing power that permits the the transmission of semi-understood or imperfectly understood information. I, I have a little demo. I want you to repeat after me exactly what you hear. Are you ready? So repeat after me. Mundify the epigastrium. Mundify the epigastrium. Again. Mundify the epigastrium. Again. Mundify the epigastrium. Just about perfect. Do you know what it means? You don't have to. Now I'm going to try another one. Same thing. Repeat after me. Are you ready? <laughs> oh, do it again now. <laughs> you can't do it. The reason you, it was so easy in the first case is that you have norms, phonetic norms. You've got English. And you automatically, involuntarily, you corrected the norm. This means that you can transmit a line that you may not understand, let alone believe, but you can transmit it faithfully from person to person because language has this wonderful proofreading capacity built right into it. It's, language wasn't the first thing on this planet that had that power, DNA has that power. And it's the same power, and this is the key, I think, to high, high enough fidelity transmission so that culture can really be cumulative. I think that's absolutely right. And, and if you think about, say, the transmission of a skill, like a skill in carpentry yep. or pottery mm. or something, um, the master demonstrates to the apprentice, not using language now, using, yep. using um, just simple yep. demonstration. And 
In this case, the, the apprentice doesn't actually imitate every muscular movement. I mean, if the master carpenter hammers 10 times, the apprentice may need to hammer 13 times in order to achieve what is obviously, the, now the norm yep, yep. is the target, which is that the nail head should be flush with the, with, with the wood. But the apprentice can clearly see what the target was, and I suppose uses some kind of intelligence to, to work out that the target was. Uh, yes, I think, I think so, and I think that's a big difference between, that's a, big difference. That's a, that's a very big difference. Um, but even there, I think there are in effect alphabets of, of excellence for human skills, and where they don't exist, transmission is really problematic. If you've ever uh, taken some courses in pottery and watched a good potter, a good instructor, ceramics instructor show you techniques, after a while you pick up a sort of alphabet of techniques, then you look at a pot and you can see, oh look, I know how this was made, I can see that this and then this and then this. You've begun to, you've begun to as it were, speak pottery. Uh, you've, you've got a vocabulary of norms. People in, in uh, software uh, engineering have a very nice term, which I'm trying to spread, being a, a meme vector. We all know what a typo is, a typographical error. And software engineers talk about a thinko. And a thinko is like a typo, but it's a level higher. It's a simple thinking mistake. Oh, I've, you've made a thinko here. If you put in an, if you forgot a parenthesis, that's just a typo. But if you use the wrong subroutine, that's a thinko. And uh, it only works where there's a clear norm to correct to. And if you look at the art that has still not solved this problem, it's dance, choreography. There's a lot of notation, but it isn't very good. Nobody has yet been able to come up with a self-normalizing set of norms for dance that's really secure. And that's why if it weren't for cinematography, for having videotapes or films, we wouldn't be able really to appreciate the, the artistry of some dancers and choreographers because they don't have what the musicians have, at least in the West, where they have the system of musical notation. There isn't a system of, there isn't an alphabet for dance with one interesting exception. Square dancing, contra dancing, folk dancing, where there's an alphabet. And that's why, at least in the United States, there's people that can preserve the Virginia reel or something because there's, everybody does a dosi -si do a little bit differently. Everybody honors their partner a little differently, but it's, a, it's, it's an element in, in basically an alphabet of moves. And that's why it's so easily transmitted and, and secure over generations. But it probably does drift over generations, doesn't it? Well, I don't know if the Virginia reel has drifted in the last 200 years. I mean, that's, that's my operational test for a, a good meme, would be if we go back to the hmm. number of generations. I, I talked about Chinese whispers, but one yeah, could yeah. talk about real generations. The test is this. If you take a recording of number yeah, yeah, one, yeah, yeah. number two, number three, number four, etc., down to number two. Oh, you're good, and you find... And then you say, yeah. and then you, you ask impartial observers, judges, yeah. just can you rank order them? Yeah. If, you, if you can rank order them, then evolution is going on. If you can't, if, say, um, number three is a very poor reproducer of whatever it is, hmm. but number four then recognizes the norm that is being aimed at and corrects it, then you will, you will find that there is no tendency for there to be a drift downwards in quality as you go along the line. Well, I, I think that the, the cumulative evolution typically happens at a, at a, at a higher level. That yes, you do get you do get mutations that then are preserved, but only against the background of of error correction, error correction, correction to a norm. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, suppose we apply yeah. these ideas to the question of why we have religion, yeah. um, which is a question I'm often asked, and I, I know you're often asked. Yeah. So we've got our two sort of models of Darwinism, both of which have a replicator, uh, genes on the one hand, means on the other, and in both cases they're selected. In the case of gene selection, the selection is based m mainly on phenotypes which are 
it's kind of in whole bodies usually. Mm -hmm. So the bird's wing helps the bird to fly, and therefore the bird survives, therefore the bird's genes survive. The very genes that did the programming of the wing survive. Now in the case of memes, we should be able to do something similar, but it's not so clear, and we need to perhaps talk about that. Um, so, and maybe religion is a good vehicle for talking about it. I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, I, think, I think it has some of the features we want. Um, first of all, I think um, we want to use, again, one of your ideas, the extended phenotype. We want to look at um, what is pr parallel to um, host manipulation by parasites, of which there's hundreds of examples in, in biology. Beautiful and horrible. Beautiful and horrible, yes. Um, uh, just bizarre and amazing uh, examples of uh, bizarre behaviors being provoked by a, a parasite which benefits the parasite's genes, not the host's. And I think we see this in religion a lot. And it's even honored, it's even named. It is, it is uh, the idea that a religious believer has been uh, enslaved by or is submitting to another power which is governing its life. It's, it's setting aside its own reproductive advantage to spread the word, to spread the gospel. It's in Christianity, it's in Islam, it's in Judaism. It is a very common idea that this is, this is a glorious thing to be uh, the uh, selfless spreader of the word of God. And if you're a celibate priest, you're, you're denying your Darwinian function. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah. So that's, that's one obvious um, application. But I think there are many others. I think that, I think it's no accident that religions around the world have used unison singing and chanting because unison singing and chanting is itself a mechanism for high fidelity. Uh, it's an, a principle which has been endorsed by computer science, von Neumann multiplexing. If you have eight people and they all have imperfect memories of the words to God save the queen or pledge of allegiance of the United States, if they say it in unison, um, the errors that individuals make along the way get drowned out and corrected. And you, you hear what the majority says and you, you refresh your own memory of the, of the text in effect. This is how religious content, rituals, holy scriptures, texts were preserved before writing. They had to have mechanisms for maintaining the fidelity and unison was was the, the beautiful, excellent mechanism for doing that because it had this multiplexing capacity. What other aspects of religion could you think of as being um, not intelligently designed, but um, just plain evolved? And what's mm. something like life after death, for example? Well, um, oh, that one's too obvious, I think. Yeah. I think it takes a steely person, uh, somebody stronger than me, to resist the temptation to say to a child whose parent or whose dog has died, not to fall back on the comforting myth of, of there being some place where this loved one has gone and can watch you. I mean, that is, that's sort of, I think, a no-brainer. It's not no surprise why that would have been invented over and over and over again. It's a, it's a good trick. It's a good trick if you can persuade yourself that what you wish to be true is true, uh, which some And that's a good meta trick, that's, yeah. which you find throughout yeah. religions. One that's been interesting me more recently is how a number of, of social institutions depend on the ignorance of those that they that they exploit. Whether it's a Ponzi scheme where the individual investors are sort of almost complicit in their ignorance of what's going on because it's not worth their while to be too inquisitive about what's going on until it's too late. And in particular, 
uh, uh, religions. I think that perhaps the single most important change in the world as far as religion is concerned is electronic communication. The internet and cell phones, transistor radios for that matter, going back a little bit. For thousands of years, religions thrived in an environment where information was hard to come by and it was, you could more or less assume that individual members of each group were not only ignorant of other religions, but even ignorant of a lot of their own religion's history and practices. And this easily maintained ignorance was I think sort of the lifeblood of, of religious solidarity. Our bodies are composed of maybe even a hundred trillion cells and they cooperate pretty well. The, the human ones are only about 10% of those and the rest are all visitors of one sort or another. And just take your human cells, the ones that have your genome, the body never has to worry about, you know, your thumbs learning something and then rebelling and <laughs> deciding to abandon ship. Um, they, they are on a, their, their life mission has been determined in development from, from the moment that they were born of, of, became the daughter cell of some mother cell. And they don't have any wherewithal to learn about the outside world and wonder whether or not maybe life would be better if they were not quite so cooperative. And religions were like that. Religions could rely on, and notice when I say rely on, there's nobody doing this relying. It's, this is the religion itself that is designed by natural selection in such a way as to presuppose the relative ignorance of the parts that make it up. You don't have to go to special lengths to shield the parts from information. Now that's all changed. It's changed hugely. And I think every religion in the world is on the cusp of either going extinct or transforming itself in ways that are really radical. It's, there's no other option. They simply will not be able to continue with the information that is now readily available. They can, they can do the, the sort of religious equivalent of Bashar al-Assad and you know, enslave the people, imprison the people, kill the people. But if you're not prepared to put all the people basically in prison, they're gonna get the information and that's gonna change everything. So my prescription for what we should be doing is very firmly but gently informing, informing, informing. Letting people all over the world know about each other's religions and letting them mull those facts over. And if the leaders of those religions have to revise their practices to account for the fact that this is happening, they're gonna transform religions in ways that are well, hard to imagine, but I think largely favorable. Not sure if I quite got the analogy with the, the toes um, not being able to break away. I mean, the, you gave us the reason for that, that they don't, they don't know how to do it. And uh, that, so that's where the analogy with, it, with, with ignorance comes. Well, well, there is, there is cancer, of course. That's the, that's the rebellion. That's uh, Francois Jacob who said, the dream of every cell is to become two cells. Yeah. And uh, that is a dream which is uh, suppressed, suppressed in, yeah. in, in multicellular organisms for very good reasons. Um, but I think more about the, the, the veil of ignorance in, in meiosis, which simply prevents um, uh, uh, germline cells from, get, from having any interaction with information about, uh, about whether, whether or not they're going to be uh, germline cells. And, and this prevents them 
in the, in, in the main from exploiting uh, features of their local environments that might otherwise be exploitable. Well, you could do your rebellion trick with, with not with toes, but with genes. I mean, you could say that yeah, the, yeah, whole, yeah, yeah. the whole genome is a collection of, you could call them viruses almost. I mean, it's as mm -hmm. though we're a kind of uh, symbiotic colony of viruses who are held together in cooperation because for generations they have had only one exit route from yeah. the body in which they sit, which is the gametes, right. the sperms or eggs. Uh, occasionally, if one of them discovers another exit route, like being sneezed out or something, then it might well uh, ad adopt it. And the dream of every gene in this sense is to get itself propagated as widely as possible. But if there is only one way out, namely mm -hmm. through the ordinary processes of sexual reproduction, that forces them into doing this cooperative enterprise of yeah. making mm -hmm. a body of the right type. And this gives rise to gene complexes, yes. which, are, which are collections of mutually compatible genes, which go together in the same, well, if you, if you imagine um, genes that make carnivore teeth, carnivore guts, carnivore sense organs, carnivore behavior patterns, mm. they go together in, in carnivore gene pools, and they are se selected to be mutually compatible with each mm -hmm. other, not yeah. as a group, but each one for itself mutually compatible as against another gene pool, which is a herbivore gene pool, where herbivore teeth, herbivore guts, herbivore behavior patterns and so on also are mutually compatible. So gene complexes are gene pools which are kept together by sexual reproduction and are prevented from contaminating each other because species don't crossbreed. Mm. There should be something like that in memes. And I think you're kind of suggesting it. Yeah. There should be something like mutually compatible memes. Maybe the whole of Roman Catholicism is one meme complex, mm. where memes um, that maybe the transubstantiation and the Trinity and, and the, yeah. all the other bollocks that, that, um, um, well, that, that well, they, they go together as opposed to um, the Protestant or Islamic ones. Good, good. And, but I think that what we can already see is l let it be true, and to a first approximation, I suppose it probably is true, that the, let's say, the Roman Catholic um, consortium of, of memes uh, worked very well for a long time, but that's breaking down now. That's breaking down. It's breaking down the... now because, because of the information flow. Yes, so it's as though you took biological evolution and you suddenly waved a wand and said, no longer can species not crossbreed. Suddenly it becomes possible to do what bacteria do yeah. uh, and copy yeah. and paste. Because yeah. uh, bacteria don't have ordinary sex, they just copy and paste. Mm -hmm. um, now you're, you're suggesting that we may be moving into a transitional phase where that becomes possible. And so as it were, you suddenly transpose herbivore guts into carnivore gene pools yeah. and mess things up. If you take a sort of bird's eye view, you see that religions change more in the last hundred years than they did in the two millennia before that. And they're probably going to change more in the next 20 years than they changed in the last hundred. You mean spawning new ones? or, or... Spawning new ones, uh, 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 abandoning old practices, abandoning oh, okay. points of creed. Oh, yeah. And uh, so things like saying, oh, it, it's all metaphorical. We don't believe that. Yeah. And, and also, uh, I'm very curious to see what the Catholic Church is going to do about the dire shortage of priests. Yes. Um, That's I was an, I was encouraging. An, I, it is. Yeah. I was in Ireland a year or so ago, and the statistic that was really striking was that only 20 or 30 years ago, there were three priests for every parish. Now there's three parishes for every priest. That's an order of magnitude drop, and it's getting worse. Getting better? Yeah. For, <laughs> worse from, from the Catholic point of view, yes. Yeah. That yeah. is very encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> but it, I think it's encouraging, but I think also I... I'm a voice of, of sort of moderation here saying, relax, 
things are going our way. Mm. Don't, don't overreact. Yeah, yeah. Just a little patience. It's unraveling itself at a great rate. The noise that we're hearing is not, I think the press is partly responsible for this. Every now and then you get these uh, breathless accounts in the press by commentators talking about how we're in the midst of a religious revival. Nonsense, I don't think there's any religious revival. I think what we're hearing, the furor, is the, is the nearly hysterical response of churches to the handwriting on the wall that yeah. they're seeing. And just say, they're there, it'll be all over soon, just, <laughs> we, don't, we don't have to, we don't have throws, to. Uh... <laughs> yes. um, it's a good moment perhaps to mention the clergy project that yeah. both of us have been in involved in. Um, it, it turns out from, from your research with Linda Lascola that um, there are lots and lots of clergymen and clergywomen who have become atheists but who daren't, in most cases, daren't actually come out and say so. Um, and the Clergy Project uh, is a, a project to provide a kind of safe place, um, a website, a safe place for disillusioned clergy people to talk to each other, compare notes, cry on each other's shoulders. Um, perhaps you could talk a bit about um, your involvement. Yeah, and, and first of all, I want to make sure that everybody understands that there's two projects here. There's the Lascola Dennett Research Project, where Linda is the, is the brilliant interviewer. And we set out not to fund a, start a website, we set out simply to find and interview in deepest confidence clergy, active, active clergy, clergy that had parishes that were preaching from pulpits, and find out what it was like to be them. And we found some. And they're, they're actually quite wonderful people. And they're, in, they're caught in a terrible trap because they wanted to do good. They wanted to help other people. They thought this was the right way to do it. And they piled diplomacy on diplomacy until it became hypocrisy. And there's no bright line between the two. And they found that they were devoting their life to preaching doctrines they no longer believed in order to carry on their good works. And they had people that were deeply dependent on them. They made lots of promises to, and they, so they were really caught in a, in a set of circumstances that they had created not to get rich, but to help their fellow human beings. And it's a very painful and very lonely place to be to me, one of the most amazing and moving facts is that our initial group of half a dozen interviewees, I think in every case, maybe, I, maybe not quite every case, but just about every case, Linda Lascola was the first human being that these people had ever talked to about this. They didn't talk to their spouses. They didn't talk to their children. They didn't talk to their superiors. They didn't talk to their colleagues. They were all alone until they found they could talk with Linda. And they're so grateful for the chance to talk these painful issues over with a understanding, no nonsense, and confidential person. So that's the La Scuola Dennett research. We're in the middle of phase two. And we have now an embarrassment of riches. There are more uh, volunteer clergy than we can handle. Uh, Linda's working as hard as she can to, to inter do the interviews and we get them transcribed and then we edit. There will be more publications coming out of that. But then something really entirely distinct happened. Several of them got together with Dan Barker. To, they wanted to create a website, a home, a safe place for their fellow clergy. And the rule was very simple. You have to be either an, a current clergy person with a parish active clergy or a former clergy person. And it started in October, less than a year ago. No advertising, no canvassing, no proselytizing. We wanted, not we, they, because I am not, a, I am, Neither Richard nor I are members of this group. We can't be, because neither one of us is former clergy. Uh, they 
started with a handful of members, and I just checked yesterday. They now have over 200 members, and over 50 of them are active clergy now. And it's turning out to be a very supportive group. They have a waiting list. They have 60 plus clergy from around the country who, are, who have applied for membership. Needless to say, the application process is careful because they have to be vetted. Uh, the clergy inside, they all use pseudonyms inside, but still they want to keep security high. They don't want lurking journalists or, or <laughs> I, got a, I, I asked them about this, a, a few of them yesterday, and I got uh, the uh, amusing report back from one of them saying, oh yes, we had one nice gentleman who wanted to become a member so that he could out us all, thinking <laughs> this would be doing a good favor. We, we discouraged him from uh, membership. So they have to keep those people at bay. And it's a, it's a careful process. So there's a, there's a bottleneck right now, people standing in line to get into this organization. Um, uh, Richard's foundation provided the initial help in providing the website, helping them get a website up and running, and properly so. But neither he nor I have any access to the conversations that go on there. This is, this is their secure thing that they're doing themselves. They're incorporating so that they can be a, a, a recipient of, uh, of charitable donations. And they're, uh, check out the website. It's the Clergy Project. Uh, they're, uh, they're growing by leaps and bounds. And a handful of them have come out. Yeah. Uh, um, I think three in the last couple of months um, of active clergy who have actually taken the step of standing up in front of their congregation in effect and saying, I'm an atheist. And they get a lot of ostracism for it. They, they, it's quite a courageous decision that they've taken in some cases. You, you realize how courageous it is when you see the reactions of some of their parishioners. Sometimes some of the reactions are humane and gentle, but a lot of people are very angry. And I, ha I think you have to acknowledge that if you'd been listening to the sermons of somebody for some years and confiding in that person with your deepest and most painful secrets and letting that person preside over the marriage of your daughter and the funeral of your father and mother and all this, and then you find out that that person is an atheist, I would think that would be a kick in the stomach for a the lot of people. The alternative way to do it, which is, it would be the sort of Karen Armstrong way, where you don't say, I'm an atheist, you say, oh, well, it's all symbolic, it's all metaphorical. Of course, we yeah. don't believe it's literally true. I mean, that's the other, that's the dishonest way of, of, um, of dealing with it. Well, one of the things that we can see, and no surprise, and we don't have enough data to say that this is a statistically significant uh, pattern, but the pattern in the early data are that there's a striking difference between what we call liberals and literals. The literals are people coming from churches that are still quite literal about the Bible. They, none of this metaphor symbolism stuff. And it includes uh, uh, evangelicals in the main and, and, and uh, Baptists. Whereas the liberals are sort of like Church of England. You know, you know do you believe in God? No, we're C of E. Uh, 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 very, very uh, sophisticated they would like to say, in the way they manipulate the metaphors that help them say the things they say. I mean, the bizarre thing Karen Armstrong tries to say is that literalism is recent anyway, and that, and that the early church was always metaphorical. I think Does not I find that, she's, she's the historical scholar, but I find that on the face of it very hard to believe. Here's what happens. Every generation, going back for several thousand years, the great majority of, of the members of, of any church just don't give it much thought. This is what the elders say, this is what mom and dad do. We go to church, we say these things. And it's, it actually is not a matter of great reflection for them. So they go along. And then there's always in every generation a few 
who just can't quite do that. They're too skeptical, they're too critical, they're too reflective, and so they think about it and they spend some serious time and effort trying to reconcile their regular beliefs with what they're told by their church they should believe. That's not easy. And they're the theologians. And they're very clever. And each generation has their theologians who, who take on the, the thankless task of creating this ever revising set of metaphors and, uh, and analogies so that they can go on saying the things they feel obliged to say and uh, finding a meaning in them that they can in good conscience accept. Needless to say that the great majority of people don't need that and they don't pay any attention to the theologians who basically pay attention to each other. One wonders why they bother. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't seem like much of a way to spend your life. Well, if, with... if, if you're raised in that tradition, loyalty to that tradition is of close to paramount importance perhaps because you believe the fib of all fibs that you can't be good without God. Um, if you believe that, then if you have this frame of mind, then I think it makes some sense to try to be a theologian. If you believe that, yeah. then how could, it, how could you be true to your belief if what you're doing is in effect making up something which is unreal because to say that you need God to be good and yet you're saying actually God doesn't exist but we're making him into a metaphor or something. Well, I think they convince themselves that they're not making it up, they're refining something. They're finding the hidden core of an idea and just scraping off the crude, primitive trappings of earlier generations and getting at the nugget at the center. I mean, that's what they think they're doing. And if they were, that would be good work. Except that it presupposes that the primitives who began it in the first place had some kind of forecasting wisdom such that they could see that Primitive as it sounds, there must there, there is a nugget there. Why should there be a nugget at all? Well, if you believe that God told them, that solves that problem. <laughs> yeah. I was told that we should um, open it up to questions. Open up for, for questions, yes. I'd like to revisit, if I may, um, when you were talking about compatible memes in religion. So you were comparing the Catholicism, for instance, with Islam and, and herbivores and carnivores. Uh, I'm a biologist, so when you, um, you talk about convergent evolution, so if you remove the isolation between those two, that you might see like a dilution effect, which is what you're talking about might be happening now. Could also the opposite effect be happening, whereby you're getting actually divergent selection. Could it be an explanation for the radical, or some of the radical um, religions we're, we're seeing? That actually you're getting religions almost being pushed further apart. There are people who've done serious historical scholarship about this, I haven't myself, but my understanding from them is that, in fact, there've always been lots of offshoots. Religions have come and gone. It's, it is like biology in this regard. There's probably been 10 religions that, or 100 religions that nobody's ever heard of for every one that, that, that we have a, a, any historical record of. They have a very short life. They live less than a generation little cults that start up, and this seems to be part of the phenomenon. Whether we're getting more of that breaking up into new cults, whether the, the sort of productivity divergence that you speak of, whether that's a, a new phenomenon, could be, but I don't, I don't know that there's any evidence of that. I suspect it's always happened, probably. I, I think it's a very yeah. interesting question, and, and there's yeah. no reason yeah. why the biological analogy shouldn't accommodate the splitting apart, equivalent to speciation, uh, as well as the keeping together. Uh, both happen in biology, and I don't see why both shouldn't happen in this case as well. There's, there, there are some differences, of course. Um, it's interesting that Judaism has had almost no speciation 
uh, uh, individuation into, into different groups, just a little bit. Whereas uh, uh, Protestantism, just, just hundreds, thousands of different little independent Protestant churches. Um, and, and an especially interesting case, of course, is, is Mormonism or uh, Church of uh, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, where we can, I think, identify the feature that enables the splitting. And that goes back to the original founders and the idea that in Mormonism, God speaks to everybody. You don't have to go through the leader, the elder of the church. You can, you can hear God's voice yourself. And what's happened over the years, every now and then when a, an elder in the, church, uh, in the Mormon church decides, when, or when the, 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 the group of elders, I don't know what they call themselves, decide on a new policy, as they did recently, not so long ago, when they decided that you know, uh, blacks were actual people and could become members of the church. Uh, there's always other Mormons who, they listen and God doesn't agree with what they've just heard, so they form a new sect. And of course, very often what God tells these people, and it's always men, is what God really wants you to do is to take that cute little 14-year-old girl next door and marry her. And so you get a pattern of sects forming where polygamy comes back in in a big way because that's what God's told them to do. I suppose it's similar in that recent splits tend to be more similar to each other, closer cousins. In evolutionary natural selection, you have um, completely unintelligent things which are subjected to chance. Um, and it seems the explanatory power of natural selection is that this looks like a, an intelligent process. It looks like, um, I don't know, people, carnivores evolving sharp teeth um, is something which is designed by an intelligence for a function. But in fact, it turns out um, that uh, it's actually arranged by chance. Whereas what you're saying um, with, what, what you see with sort of cultures is in fact, well, you have a boat, uh, a boat sinks or a boat floats, and then people actually do intelligently choose to pick the boat which floats. Um, so it seems to be there's, there's an immense, the, the fact that human beings are intelligent uh, makes the analogy um, pretty, pretty threadbare because, well, there's, you know, one operates on charts and the yeah. other operates on yeah. conscious choice. I think that's a very understandable reaction and skepticism about the memes approach, but I think it ignores a few facts. First of all, nobody invented money. Nobody invented maps. Nobody invented words. A few words have been coined by intelligent designers, word coiners. Most attempts to coin a word fail. Um, the words that we all use for the most part have no authors, have no inventors, and have, have a history of evolution and mutation that can be traced back. Darwin himself pointed out this strong analogy a long time ago. So I think that we can acknowledge that at the top of the, the frosting on the cake of human society is intelligent choice, people using their brains to make better and better things, science, politics and all manner of very uh, highly cognitive problem solving does occur. It, however, is based on a foundation which was not created that way, which grew up in some other way, and it wasn't through genes. So we need the mimetic base for the intelligent selection. And in fact, once you see that, you begin to realize that the intelligence doesn't play that big a role all the time. Uh, some of the would-be improvements turn out to be not improvements at all, and they are wiped out just like any mindless mutation which doesn't work. Uh, uh, the proof of the pudding in culture, as in biology, is whether the thing survives and replicates, and that as actually independent of however brilliant and creative and intelligent the initiator was. And so we still want to have a, a Darwinian basis for our understanding of 
cultural transmission and change. In, in Asia, for instance, you see the rise of a very aggressive disciplines of Christianity that's replacing uh, the passive non-evangelical religions that came before. So do you, do you think that um, information flow will necessarily lead to a better sort of religion in, in you know, whatever metric you're using? Good point. I think that uh, this is my eternal optimism showing perhaps. I think that the aggressive religions that you're talking about I think this is a short life phenomenon. I don't think it can last because I think that uh, it will accumulate uh, so much tension uh, because of the information that it swims in that, that I don't see how this can last. I may be wrong. I think that the only, the only trick, the only innovation that could do this is not a barrier you know, like preventing people from having cell phones or using the internet, but a, a mental barrier which so poisons them against reason and evidence that they take on irrationality as a sort of uh, uh, cult. Uh, I can imagine that protecting them from the great wash of information around them, and we see that there are things on on the web that have have that flavor um you know conspiracy theories of various sorts for instance but i don't think that's uh i don't think that's a stable arrangement for one thing i don't think that the leadership of such groups can survive for long without turning reason back on at least in themselves and then you get a a, a split between the leaders and the, and the flock exacerbated. And we've seen that before. We've seen that in uh, things like Est and uh, Scientology. Yeah. Um, I don't think those are in it for the long haul. Do you think there are policy implications for governments with respect to cutting down, for example, on intelligent design, byproducts of religion? Well, I would obviously like to cut down on, on teaching scientific error. Um, so there will be policy implications, yes. Um, I'm not sure quite how to make sure those are, are implemented, however. The best way to do it is aggressively to teach about intelligent design in a course on sociology and epistemology, uh, not in biology. Uh, and of course, in political science, you can have a unit on intelligent design. That's where it belongs. It's a phenomenon. It's a real phenomenon in the world. We should study it along with others. Uh, I think if you do that, instead of trying to outlaw it, you'll, you'll come out better. Um, in Canada, there's some interesting developments. In Quebec, there was a recent case in which uh, Quebec has instituted mandatory instruction on the world's religions to all the citizens, all the children in Quebec, including, uh, you know, homeschoolers. And uh, a parent, some parents sued and lost. And they were basically told by the courts, the highest court in Quebec, no, you do not have the right to keep your children misinformed or ignorant about these matters. Farther to the west in Canada, I think in Alberta, they tried something different. They tried to have a policy which forbade, um, oh, I think it was, in that case, it was something about um, a gay marriage or, or homosexual relations or something like this. And, and they're not getting very far with that legislation. I think that's not what you should do. I think instead of forbidding the teaching of this, you should require the teaching of something which will tend to undercut the teaching of that. And uh, on the principle that parents do not have the right to keep their children ignorant, that's child abuse. But they can tell their children any garbage they want to, but they're just gonna have to tell children who have been informed by this other material. Do we know whether the results in Quebec are at all encouraging, or is it too early to say? I, I think it's too early to say. I think that the best thing that 
atheists and secular humanists can do is show and take whatever effective public relations methods do this, show that you can be good without God. Have projects that you do under the banner of atheism or secular humanism, because I think this is actually the main reason, at least in America, why people cling to their religion. The good th news is they want to be good. And they're just afraid that they can't be good without God. And we just have to show them, no, not at all. So I think giving examples of all the good things and all the good people who are good without God is probably the single most effective thing to do. It doesn't do much good to ridicule the flock, the parishioners. But I think when their leaders say stupid things, then I think laughter is probably the best thing. Um, but you have to be careful not to create victims, martyrs, uh, by, by, your, by your laughter. Uh, I, I think that's a fine line there. Uh, sometimes you just have to hoot, though. Sometimes it's just so preposterous that, that it's worth pointing out and letting people be embarrassed and, and discomfited. And then, of course, the followers will be discomfited vicariously. And that's, that may be enough. But I think em embarrassing people to their face in front of their friends or family is not a good idea ever. There's a difference between um, using ridicule on a particular individual and expecting to change their minds, which you probably won't, and using ridicule on a, on a particular point of view. No, not on a person, but on a particular no. point of view. And, um, Letting third parties who haven't really thought about it very much, as Dan was saying earlier, um, that they then might be influenced. I, I myself was influenced when I was an undergraduate. I was rather taken, I'm ashamed now to admit, with Teilhard de Chardin and, and the phenomenon of man. Um, mm. And I was, I was um, taken in by what Peter Medower called that euphoristic, tipsy prose poetry which is one of the more tiresome manifestations of the French spirit. <laughs> um, so I was taken in by that. Uh, and then I read Medawa's review of the phenomenon the of famous. Man, and was completely won over. I mean, immediately this, this witty takedown of this pretentious theologian. Um, and I realized, gosh, I'd been fooled, I'd been conned. Um, and Good. so one of yeah. the things that, that I try to do when I do occasionally indulge in ridicule um, is that I'm not trying to actually change the mind of, of, a, of a real dyed-in-the-wool, deeply religious person. I'm trying to change the mind of somebody who's sitting on the fence and who hasn't really um, given it very, very much thought. But I do want to come back to your point about um, you can be moral without God, of course. I mean, the reason that's the most important point to get across is quite simply the totally bizarre fact that an awful lot of people think you do need God to be to be moral. If they gave it a moment's thought, they would realize that that, um, well, it's, you certainly don't get your morals from the Bible or the Quran. So, um, I mean, anybody who does that hasn't read the Bible. Um, but, but then you're left with your only reason you're good is that you're sucking up to God, <laughs> which is a very ignoble reason yeah. to be good. <laughs> Pie in the sky, yes. I'd like to take this moment to point out, which may be obvious to all of you, maybe not, that um, among the horsemen of atheism, uh, I'm usually regarded as the, as the sort of politest, least, least aggressive. And, and now that Hitch is gone, alas, I, I guess the, the, the title of, of most acerbic goes to Richard. Um, but, if you haven't seen it, let me recommend his, I think, brilliant interview of Father George Coyne, the uh, Catholic astronomer, Vatican astronomer, an intelligent, good man. And Richard interviews him at some length. And he is, you're so gentle and diplomatic, and you're just leading him, leading him, leading him, and you never bark and you never hoot and you just let this nice man dig himself in deeper and deeper and deeper 
it's, it's, I thought it was uh, an exemplary piece of, uh, of exposure. And you were, you were perfectly uh, respectful of him at every moment. I thought that was well done. Well, he ended up by saying that he had absolutely no reason to believe in God whatsoever. So I said, well, why do you then? He said, because I was brought up Roman Catholic. That was the only reason, and he was quite frank about that. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if evolution is a mechanism that can be sort of extrapolated to explain culture and religion. Uh, how can we use this framework to explain um, people engaging in behaviors that seem to contradict these principles like a suicide bomber? Uh, why do people engage in, in these sort, sorts of behaviors? And c does it mean that beliefs or uh, uh, ideas can override somehow this kind of basic impulses for survival? And could this be potentially a beneficial mechanism, assuming that you have uh, a rational idea? I think, this is, I think this is an easy question to answer. We're the only species that goes in for this craziness, really. And we do it because of our being infected by memes that have their own agendas. In the same way that there are suicidal ants that climb up stalks of grass where they're more likely to be eaten by sheep or cows. And it's because their brain has been invaded by a lancet fluke Dicrocilium dendriticum that needs to get into the belly of a cow or a sheep. This is host manipulation by parasite. And once you recognize that cultural entities can do that, can harness a person's energy and talent and cognitive skills and all the rest to further its replicative purposes, and you say, well, wait a minute, a religion doesn't have any, it's not intelligent. Well, what do you, you think a lancet fluke is intelligent? <laughs> it's, it has the IQ of, of a carrot. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be intelligent, it just has to be designed to have this effect and it will benefit from it. And similarly, a religious meme that is designed by evolution, by cultural evolution, to have the effect <coughs> of promoting uh, selfless martyrdom behavior on behalf of those that it infects. That's a very effective meme. Sam Harris said, the thing you have to understand is that these people really believe what they say they believe. They actually believe that when they die a martyr's death, they are going to a martyr's paradise. And moreover, every time a suicide bomber is successful, there are numerous copycats people who wish to, to imitate. It literally is a, a meme in the sense of self-copy. Um, so it's, it's not, a, as Dan says, it's not at all difficult to understand how it happens once you grasp that natural selection doesn't only select genes, in which case you couldn't have suicide, um, but it selects memes as well, in which case it's very easy. I think most of us if we reflected good and hard, could think of some purpose, some averting some terrible catastrophe on this planet, that we would be prepared to risk and even sacrifice our lives for. It doesn't have to be religious. That's what thinking beings do. They take ideas seriously and that's how we differ from other animals. We take ideas very seriously. The good news is that the fastest growing category in the world is no religion at all. It's growing faster than Islam, which is the fastest growing religion. And Islam is growing largely by birth rate, not by uh, conversion. And for a religion to grow by birth rate presupposes that children inherit the religion of their parents. That's right. Which unfortunately they do but that's a, that's a loop we've got to try and break. Well, yes, it, it's, actually it's not that hard to break. Um, the Baptist commissioned a survey by their own uh, social scientists who, 
said if current trends condition, uh, continue, this was a few years ago reported in the New York Times, only 4% of the youngsters that were being raised as Baptists were going to be Bible-believing adults. It takes, it takes 20 years you know, to, to raise a believer and 20 minutes to turn them into an apostate. That's an encouraging thought. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It happens. I mean, you get mail, I get mail. True. Yeah. You said uh, earlier that you thought one of the best ways to uh, see religion slowly dissolve was by showing uh, all the followers the different religions and non-religions and the ideas. But surely that precludes two other scenarios which actually create the opposite effect that don't uh, uh, don't help dissolve religion, they help strengthen it. The first is that uh, different religions with similar bases, such as the Abrahamic religions, merely see what they have in common, which uh, increases the, their belief that they are correct, not the atheists, uh, after seeing how wide, how wide their beliefs are held in other cultures, not just their own. The other is that by showing religious followers uh, their or different beliefs, you don't confuse them, you merely create a rally around the flag effect, whereby they see uh, what they, they see effectively their opposition, they see what even the casual, previously casual believers see that what the beliefs that they've grown up with as under threat, and so they merely grow stronger in that. Uh, what would you say to that? Well, that's, I think that's a possibility in, in both cases. I would insist on putting into uh, the compulsory education on religions that I uh, supported, um, a good sympathetic account of the John Frum religion, the cargo cult, which was started during World War II. And it's hilarious. It's, it's, heart, it's, it's heartbreaking in a way because the natives on this little island are still uh, marching around carrying American flags and waiting for John Frum their savior to come back with cargo. And uh, I think just letting people know that, it just, it puts a little seed into their minds. And it may take a long time, but if you show them that vividly, at some point, don't expect immediate recognition, but at some point it may suddenly hit them, wait a minute, isn't that how, sort of how my religion started? Isn't mine just as wacky as these? The juxtaposition of different religions, um, even though they can see some similarities, uh, they'll see similarities with even the wildest and most exotic religion, between similarities between that religion and their own, and, and that will be food for thought. I think the questioner has a point, though, that, that, that there does seem to be a tendency to say, oh, well, of course, that's just ridiculous, but my religion uh, is... Um... There's a tendency, yes, of course. Mm. But I think, I think that's um, a reaction which is a, is a relatively brittle reaction. I don't mind that people have that reaction. I think, you know, for the time being, that's, of course, how they're going to react. Give them a few years, let them think about it for a while. Uh, I, I am a believer in sort of slow working ideas here. Just let them settle in and, and let people see what they think in a while. I think it's always a mistake to press for a, press for a conversion right now. People just don't want to do that. And don't try, just settle for laying a few facts on them and letting them, letting those facts percolate away in their heads for a while and see what comes of it later. Science says that solidity is um, the power to exclude other bodies, but we define other bodies as solid. Science doesn't actually explain the most basic notions of the world, but kind of just shows the limits of our rationality. Well, I think there's this much truth in that. Um, there are questions that are very, very important that are not scientific questions. They are, in a very broad sense, political questions. They're questions where we have to decide how we want 
to live and how we want others to live, what we want the imaginary social contract to be. Um, science isn't going to tell you what that is. A process which is a little bit like science is the way that can get done, I think, ideally, and that is a bringing together people and letting everybody, under rules of, of respectful discourse, try to persuade each other of what they think the most important things are. Whatever consensus you get from that sort of exercise uh, can do as good a job as any of settling how, you know, what, what should be important in this society. Um, and that's not science, it's, but it, it's reasonable, it's rational. Uh, and I don't think there's any uh, really important issues that can't be addressed in that way. I mean, it has been suggested that there are certain questions which seem like scientific questions, sort of what's the origin of the laws of physics or yeah, something of yeah. that sort might be uh, forever unanswerable by science. All I'd say to that is that if science can't answer them, certainly nothing else can. Exactly. Yeah. We, we just have to get used to the fact that some questions we can't answer. Fantastic. Well, um, thank you very much to Professor Richard Dawkins and Professor Daniel Dennett, and thank you very much for coming.